what we're going to talk about now is a phenomenon called refraction, which is something that happens when light passes from one medium into a different medium. And to show this, you know, if we look at light here passing through this water and coming into air, this is why when I take this straight handle of a spoon and I put it into the water, it appears that the handle of the spoon is broken because the light that is coming out of the water and into the air is refracted. Now this is possibly the oldest physics we're going to be discussing in this course. The refraction was first noted by Ptolemy in Alexandria in ancient Egypt and was then built upon about a thousand, you know, a thousand plus years later by Ibn Sal um, who actually first discovered the law of refraction that we're going to be talking about. However, it was rediscovered, if you like, in the uh, 1600s by a Dutch physicist with the name of Snellius. And so the law of refraction is also sometimes referred to as Snell's law, even though it was written down in Baghdad in 984 AD for the first time. So to study how this is going to work, let's go and first have a look at the, uh, what happens when light is incident on a boundary between media, and we'll study it on the computer first, and then we'll have a look at a demonstration. So now we're going to talk about refraction. And in refraction, we have a ray here that's incident on the edge of a uh, medium. And so in this case, uh, we'll assume it's something like air, and it's going into something like glass. And what happens is when the ray is refract refracted, it is bent, and it can either be bent towards the uh, uh, perpendicular of the surface, or it can be bent away from it. So in this case, it's bent slightly towards, and we have a second angle here that is called the angle of refraction. Now, it's also worth pointing out that typically when a ray of light um, hits the surface of a material, it's not entirely refracted. There is also going to be a component that is reflected out here. And then, of course, uh, you have this angle here, which is the angle of uh, reflection. And, of course, the angle of reflection is equal to this angle of uh, incidence here. So, in order to understand the relationship between the angle of refraction and the angle of incidence, let's tidy up this diagram and have a look at it in a bit more detail. So here we have that same diagram tidied up. This theta 1 is the angle of incidence, and theta 2 here is the angle of refraction. And what we've also introduced here is a new property of a material which is called the refractive index. And the refractive index is a measure of the speed of light in that material. And in fact, what really it's saying is that the speed of light um, in material one is going to be equal to the speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index um, of the material. So the refractive index here is always larger than or equal to one, except for very special cases where um, you know they, they do fancy things in sort of metamaterials where you can um, get refractive indices that are in fact negative or, or certainly outside the normal range. But for all normal materials, and certainly all the materials we're going to deal with in this course, the refractive index is greater than or equal to 1. So what the uh, law of refraction says is that the refractive index of the material multiplied by the sine of the angle of incidence is equal to the refractive index of the material that's being entered multiplied by the sine of the angle of refraction. Um, and so we can rewrite this as well as the sine of theta 1 divided by the sine of theta 2 is equal to n2 over n1. And so this is what we call the law of refraction, or sometimes it's referred to Snell's law, even though the first person that's recorded to have written it down was uh, Ibn Sal in Baghdad in 984 AD. So what we're going to do now is demonstrate the law of refraction. So again, we've got the ray box here, and this time I've got a block of transparent material that has a refractive index that's higher than air. 
So what the law of refraction tells us is that the angle of incidence of the ray of light that we've got here should be greater than the angle of refraction because the refractive index here is higher. And so the light should bend so that it's closer to the perpendicular of this surface when it enters this block. So let's see if that's the case. So here you can see, if first of all, if I put it so that the light is perpendicular to the surface, then the light is not uh, deflected at all. But as I rotate the block, you can see that as the angle of incidence increases, the light does indeed bend, and it bends when it enters so that it is closer to the perpendicular. Now, when the ray of light leaves the box, uh, this block, it's going from a high refractive index to a low refractive index, and that means that it also bends, but now it bends so that it is um, further away from the perpendicular to the surface. So now we have a question. What happens if this ray of light inside the block is incident on the surface at such a large angle that the, ref you know, the refracted ray of light is bent beyond 90 degrees. So to study that, we need to get a different shape of block. So now I've got a triangular prism-shaped block made of the same material, and if I put it in the beam here, you can see that it was behaving just like the uh, other block of material. We have refraction when it enters, and we have refraction when it leaves. But now, what I'm going to do is, because these two faces now have an angle between them, I can um, increase this angle of incidence for the inside ray on the external surface, and we'll see what happens as this ray here, the refracted ray, gets closer and closer to this surface. So here we go, it's getting closer, and it suddenly gets reflected inside the block. So you can see now that we have the ray coming in, it's refracted at this surface, and then here at this surface there's no ray leaving, there's nothing going out of the block here, it is totally internally reflected. And this happens if the angle of incidence is above a certain critical angle. So to calculate that angle, let's go back and have a look at the system on the computer screen. So to find the value for this critical angle, we want to consider the limiting case. And the limiting case is when the uh, ray of light is incident at the critical angle, and the angle of refraction on the other side of the boundary is exactly 90 degrees. And that way, if we increase the angle of incidence any more, then clearly this ray cannot have an angle of refraction greater than 90 degrees, because that would mean it wasn't entering this medium, it was coming back into the original medium. And that's the boundary condition where you switch from refraction to total internal reflection. So given this, we can just use the law of refraction. And the law of refraction says that n1 times the sine of the angle of incidence, which is this critical angle in this case, is equal to n2 times the sine of the angle of refraction, which in this case is 90 degrees. And the sine of 90 degrees is just equal to 1. And so this equation very simply becomes that the critical angle is the inverse sine of n2 divided by n1. And clearly, since this is an inverse sine, this value here, if there's going to be a solution, must be less than 1. And so that requires that n2 is less than n1. Now, of course, there is the limiting condition when n2 equals n1, but then there is no boundary here because you've got the same refractive index on both sides, and the light will just pass unhindered. It won't be refracted or reflected. There's essentially no boundary as far as the light's concerned. So for a critical angle and to get total internal reflection, you must be attempting to enter a medium which has a lower refractive index. And then if your angle of incidence is greater than this critical angle, you will be totally internally reflected instead of refracted. Happy Halloween. So what is giving me my ghostly appearance is a combination of the two effects we've just talked about, and that is reflection and refraction. 
what is happening is light is reflecting off my face and is hitting a pane of glass that's angled at 45 degrees to the camera and then it reflects into the camera lens and so that's the reflection whereas light from the background is passing through the glass it's essentially being refracted by the sheet of glass and then also passing into the camera lens and if we zoom out you'll be able to see the edges of the sheet of glass and if I move my hands around you should see at some point that they disappear off the edge of the sheet of glass and that's when there's no more reflection but when the camera is zoomed in uh, you can't see the edges of the plane of glass and all you see is the uh, ghostly image in the center and this was the physics behind a um, special effect on the Victorian stage that was called Pepper's Ghost and when a play called for a ghost to appear they would put a sheet of glass that was angled to the audience the actor playing the ghost would stand in the wings and then a light would be shone on them and their image would be superimposed over the uh, background and giving the image that a ghost had actually appeared on the stage a more modern uh, application of this physics is in head-up displays which first appeared sort of in fighter jets but are now appearing in high-end cars to present additional information to the driver and the way that they work is you have a bright display that's in the dashboard and then it reflects off the uh, window screen of the car and into the eyes of the driver and so the driver can see both the information about the car that, that the car is providing as well as the road ahead of them. So that is a, a very good application of both reflection and refraction and when light is incident on a surface what this shows is that in general you get both effects occurring at the same time part of the ray will be reflected and part of the way ray will be refracted so for now goodbye